Last night, I dreamt I went to Mandalay again. It seemed to me I stood by the iron gate leading to the drive. And for a while, I could not enter, for the way was barred to me. Then, like all dreamers, I was possessed of a sudden the supernatural powers and passed like a spirit through the barrier before me. The drive wound away in front of me, twisting and turning as it had always done. But as I advanced, I was aware that a change had come upon it. Nature had come into her own again, and little by little had encroached upon the drive with long, tenacious fingers. On and on wound the poor thread that had once been our drive. And finally, there was Mandalay. Mandalay, secretive and silent. Time could not mar the perfect symmetry of those walls. Moonlight can play odd tricks upon the fancy. And suddenly it seemed to me that light came from the windows. And then a cloud came upon the moon and hovered an instant like a dark hand before a face. The illusion went with it. I looked upon a desolate shell, with no whisper of the past about its staring walls. We can never go back to Mandalay again. That much is certain. But sometimes, in my dreams, I do go back to the strange days of my life, which began for me in the south of France. What are you shouting about? Who are you? What are you staring at? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to stare, but I... I only thought... Oh, you did it. You, well, what are you doing here? I was only walking. Well, get on with your walking. Don't hang about here screaming. I'll never come to Monte Carlo out of season again. Not a single well-known personality in the hotel. Stone cold. Wait up. Gasson, call him. Tell him to get me some... Why, it's Max de Winter. How do you do? How do you do? I'm Edith Van Hopper. It's so nice to run into you here. Just when I was beginning to despair of finding any old friends here in Monte. But do sit down and have some coffee. Mr. DeWitter's having some coffee with me. Go and ask the stupid waiter for another cup. I'm afraid I must contradict you. You shall both have coffee with me. Gasson, give me some coffee, please. Cigarette? No, thank you. You know, I recognized you just as soon as you came in. Though I haven't seen you since that night at the casino at Palm Beach. <laughs> Perhaps you don't remember an old woman like me. Are you playing the tables much here at Monte? No, I'm afraid that sort of thing ceased to amuse me years ago. I can well understand that. As for me, if I had a home like Mandalay, I should certainly never come to Monte. I hear it's one of the biggest places in that part of the country, and you just can't beat it for beauty. And what do you think of Monte Carlo? Or don't you think of it at all? Oh, well, well, I think it's rather artificial. She's spoiled, Mr. DeWitter. That's her trouble. Most girls will give their eyes for a chance to see Monte. Wouldn't that rather defeat the purpose? Now that we've found each other again, I hope I shall see something of you. You must come and have a drink in my suite. I hope they've given you a good room. The place is empty, so if you're uncomfortable, mind you, make a fuss. Your valet is unpacked for you, I suppose. I'm afraid I don't possess one. Perhaps you'd like to do it for me. Well, I... <laughs> I hardly think... Uh... Perhaps you can make yourself useful to Mr. DeWitt if he wants anything done. You're a capable child in many ways. That's a charming suggestion, but I'm afraid I cling to the old motto. He travels fastest who travels alone. Perhaps you've not heard of it. Good night. What do you make of that? 
Do you suppose that sudden departure was intended to be funny? Come, don't sit there gawking. Let's go upstairs. Have you got the key? Yes, Mrs. Van Hopper. I remember when I was younger, there was a well-known writer who used to dart down the back way whenever he saw me coming. I suppose he was in love with me and wasn't quite sure of himself. Well, c'est la vie. By the way, my dear, don't think that I mean to be unkind. But you were just a teeny weeny bit forward with Mr. De Winter. Your effort to enter the conversation quite embarrassed me, and I'm sure it did him. Men loathe that sort of thing. Oh, Cub, don't suck. After all, I am responsible for your behavior here. Perhaps he didn't notice it. Poor thing. I suppose he just can't get over his wife's death. They say he simply adored her. Please don't bother. It doesn't really matter. Oh, leave that. Leave that. Go and lay another place at my table. Mademoiselle will have lunch with me. Oh, but I, I couldn't possibly. Why not? Oh, well, please don't be polite. I, it's very kind of you, but I'll be all right if they just change the cloth. I wasn't being polite. I should have asked you to have lunch with me, even if we hadn't upset the bars so clumsily. Come along. We needn't talk to each other if we don't feel like it. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, uh, I'll just ha have some, some scrambled eggs. Oh, he met Miss Ellen. What's happened to your friend? Oh, she's ill in bed with a cold. I'm sorry I was so rude to you yesterday. The only excuse I can offer is that I've become boorish through living alone. You weren't really. You simply wanted to be alone and... <laughs> Tell me, is Mrs. Van Hopper a friend of yours or just a relation? No, she's my employer. I'm what is known as a paid companion. Oh, I didn't know companionship could be bought. I looked up the word companion in the dictionary once. It said, a friend of the bosom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't envy you the privilege. Oh, she's very kind, really, and I have to earn my living. Haven't you any family? No, my, my mother died years and years ago, and then there was only my father, and, and he died last summer. And then I took this job. How rotten for you. Yes, it was rather, because, you see, we got on so well together. You and your father? Yes, he, he was a lovely person, very unusual. What was he? A painter. Ah, was he a good one? Well, I thought so, but people didn't understand him. Yes, that's often the trouble. He, he painted trees. It, at least, it was one tree. You mean he painted the same tree over and over again? Yes, you see, he had a theory that if you should find one perfect thing or place or person, you should stick to it. Do you think that's very silly? Not at all. I'm a firm believer in that myself. And what did you find to do with yourself while he was painting his tree? Well, I sat with him and I sketched a little. I, I don't do it very well, though. Oh, you're going sketching this afternoon? Yes. Where? I haven't made up my mind. I'll drive you somewhere in the car. Oh, no, please, I didn't mean... Oh, nonsense. Finish up that mess and we'll get along. Thank you. It's very kind of you, but I'm not very hungry. Oh, come on. Eat it up like a good girl. Oh, You've taken long enough for that sketch. I should expect a really fine work of art. Oh, no, don't look at it. It's not nearly good enough. But well, it can't be as bad as all that. Now, don't rub it all out. Let me see it first. Well, it's the perspective. I never can get it right. Oh, dear. Tell me, is it um, the perspective that gives my nose that curious twist in the middle? Well, you're not a very easy subject to sketch. Your, no? your expression keeps changing all the time. Does it? Well, I'd, I'd concentrate on the view instead if I were you. Much more worthwhile. Rather reminds me of our coastline at home. Do you know Cornwall at all? Yes, I went there once with my father on holiday. I, I was in a shop once, and I saw a, a postcard with a beautiful house on it, right by the sea. And I asked whose house it was, and the old lady said, that's Mandalay. I felt ashamed for not knowing. And Mandalay is beautiful. To me, it's just the place where I was born. I've lived in all my life. But now, I don't suppose I shall ever see it again. We're, we're lucky not to uh, be home during the bad weather, aren't we? Hmm. I, I can't ever remember enjoying swimming in England till, till June, can you? The water's so warm here that I could stay in all day. There's a dangerous undertow, and there's a man drowned here last year. I never have any fear of drowning, have you?
Come, I'll take you home. Oh, yes. I know Mr. DeWitt well. I knew his wife, too. Before she married, she was the beautiful Rebecca Hildreth, you know. She was drowned, poor dear, while she was sailing near Mandalay. He never talks about it, of course, but he's a broken man. I suppose I'd better have him. Mm. Wretched stuff! Give me a chocolate, quick! Oh, there you are! It's about time! Hurry up, I want to play some rummy. She was the beautiful Rebecca Hildred, you know. They say he simply adored her. She was the beautiful Rebecca Hildred, you know. I suppose he just can't get over his wife's death. She was the beautiful Rebecca Hildred, you know. But he's a broken man. Well, where are you going? Oh, I thought I'd take a tennis lesson. Oh, I see. I suppose you've had a look at the pro, and he's desperately handsome, and you've conceived a schoolgirl crush on him. All right, go ahead and make the most of it. Off duty? Oh, yes, Mrs. Van Hopper's cold's turned into flu, so she's going to train nurse. I'm sorry for the nurse. You keen on tennis? No, not particularly. That's good. We'll go for a drive. How are you feeling? You got on rather well with him, didn't you? That pro must have been teaching you other things than tennis. Hurry up, I want you to make some calls. I wonder if Mr. DeWitter is still in the hotel. For the number of lessons you've had, you ought to be ready for Wimbledon. But this will be your last, so make the most of it. Trouble is, for me laid up like this, you haven't had enough to do. But I'm getting rid of that nurse today, and from now on, you'll stick to your job. Yes, Mrs. Van Harper. Nurse? Yes, Miss Van Harper? Are you absolutely sure you left those messages for Mr. DeWinter? Why, well, yes, madame. I simply can't believe it. He would most certainly have called me back. Oh, well, poor boy. I simply hate to see him so alone. You know, I... I wish there could be an invention that bottled up the memory like perfume and it never faded, never got stale. Then whenever I wanted to, I could uncork the bottle and, and live the memory all over again. And what particular moment in your young life would you want to keep? Oh, all of them. All these last few days. I, I feel so I'd... I collected a whole shelf full of bottles. Sometimes, you know, those little bottles contain demons that have a way of popping out at you, just as you're trying most desperately to forget. Stop biting your nails. Oh, I wish I were a woman of 36, dressed in black satin with a string of pearls. <laughs> You wouldn't be here with me if you were. Would you please tell me, Mr. Lewinda, why you asked me to come out with you? Well, it's obvious that you want to be kind, but why do you choose me for your chat? I asked you to come out with me because I wanted your company. You've blotted out the past for me more than all the bright lights of Monte Carlo. But if you think I just asked you out of kindness or charity, you can leave the car now and find your own way home. Go on, open the door and get out. Get a 
blow your nose. Thank you. Please don't call me Mr. De Winter. I have a very impressive array of first names. George Fortescue Maximilian. But you needn't bother with them all at once. My family call me Maxim. And another thing. Please promise me never to wear black satin or pearls. Or to be 36 years old. Yes, Maxim. My daughter's engaged to be married. Oh, really? How nice. We must leave for New York at once, get reservations on the Aquitania, and we'll take the 12.30 train for Cherbourg. Hurry up and get in a maid to help with the packing. We've no time to waste. Go on and don't dawdle. Mr. De Winter, please. Oh, he's gone out riding. He won't be back till noon. Oh. Well, give me the porter, please. I'll go and see if there's anything left in my room. Has Mr. De Winter come in yet? Oh, he has. Would you connect me, please? Oh, I... Uh, I, I was looking for my book. I, I, I suppose I've packed it. Well, come on. The car's waiting at the door. address if they happen to find that book. Would you ring Mr. De Winter, please? Yes, madame. 182. <laughs> there isn't any answer. Thank you. Tell her to hurry up. Yes, madame. I was looking for Mr. De Winter. Mr. De Winter just ordered breakfast in his room, mademoiselle. Come in. Hello. What are you doing here? Anything the matter? I've come to say goodbye. We're going away. What on earth are you talking about? It's true. We're going now, and I was afraid I wouldn't see you again. Where's she taking you to? New York. I don't want to go. I, I shall hate it. I shall be miserable. I'll dress in here. I shan't be long. Which would you prefer, New York or Mandalay? Oh, please don't joke about it. Mrs. Van Hoppe is waiting, and I th I'd better say goodbye now. I repeat what I said. Either you go to America with Mrs. Van Hoppe, or you come home to Mandalay with me. You mean you want a secretary or something? I'm asking you to marry me, you little fool. Is that my food? I'm famished. I didn't have any breakfast. Ah, my suggestion didn't seem to go at all well. Sorry. Oh, but you don't understand. It's that I... Well, I'm not the sort of person men marry. What on earth do you mean? I don't belong in your sort of world, for, for one thing. Well, what is my sort of world? 
Oh, well, mandolin, you know what I mean. Well, I'm the best judge of whether you belong there or not. Of course, if you don't love me, that's a different thing. Fine blow to my conceit, that's all. Oh, I do love you. I love you most dreadfully. I've been crying all morning because I thought I'd never see you again. Bless you for that. I'll remind you of this one day. You won't believe me. It's a pity you have to grow up. Well, now that's settled, you may pour me out some coffee. Two lumps of sugar and some milk, please. Same with my tea, don't forget. Who's going to break the news to Mrs. Van Hopper? Shall you or shall I? Oh, you tell it. She'll be so angry. What's the number of her room? Oh, she's not there. She's, she's downstairs in the car. Hello? Give me the date, please. Hello? You'll find Mrs. Van Hopper waiting outside in her car. Would you ask her with my compliments? Would she very kind to come up and see me in my room? Yes, in my room. Mr. De Winter says, please, for you to come up to his room. Mr. De Winter? Why, certainly. <laughs> this isn't at all your idea of a proposal, is it? It should be in a conservatory. You in a white frock with a red rose in your hand. And a violin playing in the distance. And I should be making violent love to you behind a palm tree. <laughs> Poor darling. Never mind. Oh, I don't mind. Don't worry, don't worry. You won't have to say a word. I'm so glad you called me, Mr. De Winter. I was making a hasty departure. It was so rude of me not to let you know. But a cable came this morning announcing that my daughter is engaged to be married. That's rather a coincidence, Mrs. Van Hopper. I asked you up here in order to tell you of my engagement. You don't mean it. Oh, how perfectly wonderful. How romantic. Who is the lucky lady? I apologize for depriving you of your companion in this abrupt way. I do hope it won't inconvenience you too greatly. When did all this happen? Just now, Mrs. Van Hopper. Just a few minutes ago. I simply can't believe it. And I suppose I ought to scold you for not having breathed a word of all of this to me. What am I thinking of? I shall give you both my congratulations and my blessings. I'm very happy for you both. When and where is the wedding to be? Here, as soon as possible. A whirlwind romance. Splendid. I could easily postpone my sailing for a week. This poor child has no mother, so I shall take responsibility for all the arrangements. Trousseau, reception and everything, and I'll give the bride away. When I luggage, go down and tell the porter to take everything out of the car. Just a minute. We're most grateful, Mrs. Van Hopper, but I think we'd both prefer to have it all as quiet as possible. And I couldn't possibly allow you to change your sailing plans. Oh, good. <laughs> no, no, no. Dear, I'll go down and see that your luggage is brought back. Thank you, Max. So this is what's been happening during my illness. Tennis lessons my foot. I suppose I have to hand it to you for a fast worker. How did you manage it? Still water certainly run deep. Tell me, have you been doing anything you shouldn't? I, I don't know what you mean. Oh, well, never mind. I always did say that Englishmen have strange tastes. But you certainly have your work cut out as mistress of Manderley. To be perfectly frank with you, my dear, I can't see you doing it. You haven't the experience, you haven't the faintest idea of what it means to be a great lady. Of course, you know what he's marrying you, don't you? You haven't flattered yourself that he's in love with you. Fact is, that empty house got on his nerves to such an extent, he nearly went off his head. He just couldn't go on living alone. You better leave, Mrs. Van Hopper. You'll miss your train. Mrs. De Winter. Goodbye, my dear, and good luck. Oh, he says I've forgotten the proof that we're married. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> ah, somebody else had the same idea. Isn't she sweet? <laughs> yes. You'd have liked a bridal veil, wouldn't you? 
or at least. Oh, Max, you're lovely. Oh, how lovely. Oh, perfectly lovely. Oh, perfectly lovely. Welcome home, Mr. De Winter. Thank you, Smith. Cold, darling? Yes, just a little bit. There's no need to be frightened, you know. Just be yourself and they'll all adore you. You don't have to worry about the house at all. Mrs. Danvers is the housekeeper. Just leave it to her. Hello. It's starting to rain. Better hurry up. Here, have this. Put it over your head. Thank you. Everybody well? Yes, thank you, sir. We're glad to see you home, sir. This is Mrs. De Winterfred. How do you do? Oh, I didn't expect the whole staff to be in attendance. Mr. Danvers' sir. Oh. Sorry about this. Won't take long. This is Mrs. Danvers. How do you do? How do you do? I have everything in readiness for you. That's very good of you. I, I didn't expect anything. I think we'd like some tea, Frith. Ready in the library, sir. Come along, darling. Good evening, Mrs. Danvers. Good evening, madam. I hope Alice was satisfactory, madam. Oh, yes, thank you. Perfectly. She's the parlour maid. She'll have to look after you until your own maid arrives. Oh, but I haven't a maid. I, I'm sure Alice will do very nicely. I'm afraid that would not do for very long, madam. It's usual for ladies in your position to have a personal maid. I hope you approve the new decoration of these rooms, madam. Oh, I, I didn't know it had been changed. I hope you haven't been to too much trouble. I only followed out Mr. De Winter's instructions. Oh, well, what did it look like before? It had an old paper and different hangings. It was never used much, except for occasional visitors. Oh, then it wasn't Mr. De Winter's room originally? No, madam. He's never used the east wing before. Of course, there's no view of the sea from here. The only good view of the sea is from the west wing. The room's very charming, and, and I'm sure I'll be comfortable. If there's anything you want done, madam, you have only to tell me. I suppose you've been at Mandalay for many years, longer than anyone else. Not so long as Frith. He was here when the old gentleman was living, when Mr. De Winter was a boy. Oh, I see, and you didn't come till after that. I came here when the first Mrs. De Winter was a bride. Mrs. Danvers, I, I do hope we'll be friends. Uh, you must be patient with me. This sort of life is new to me, and. I do want to make a success of it and make Mr. De Winter happy, so I know I can leave all the household arrangements to you. Very well. I hope I shall do everything to your satisfaction, madam. I've managed the house since Mrs. De Winter's death, and Mr. De Winter has never complained. I think I'll go downstairs now.
That room in the west wing I was telling you about is there through that door. It's not used now. It's the most beautiful room in the house. The only one that looks down across the lawns to the sea. It was Mrs. De Winter's room. Good morning. Good morning. You're Mrs. De Winter, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> My name's Crawley. But I, I manage the estate for Maxim. Awfully glad to meet you. There's a <laughs> fearful lot of stuff piled up while Maxim was away. Yes, I, I'm sure there must have been. I, I, I do wish I could help with some of it. No, no. Frank never allows anybody to help him. He's like an old mother hen with his bills and rents and taxes. Come on, Frank, we must go over these estimates. I'll get my papers. You'll find quantities of breakfast over there, but you must eat it all or Cook will be mortally offended. Well, I'll do my best, Maxim. <laughs> I have to go over the place with Frank just to make sure that he hasn't lost any of it. You'll be all right, won't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Getting acquainted with your new home. <laughs> have a look at the Times. There's a thrilling article on what's the matter with English cricket. Oh, uh, yes. Um, well, my sister Beatrice and her husband, Giles Lacey, have invited themselves over for lunch. Today? Yes. I suppose the old girl can't wait to look you over. <laughs> You'll find her very direct. If she doesn't like you, she'll probably tell you so to your face. <laughs> Don't worry, darling. I'll be back in time to protect you from her. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, Maxim. Goodbye. Goodbye. Could get for you, ma'am. Oh, no, thank you, Frith. I'm really not very hungry. Thank you. The paper, ma'am. Oh, yes, thank you, Frith. Oh, I slipped. Oh, thank you, Frith. It's big, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Adelaide is a big place. This was the banquet hall in the old days. It is still used on great occasions, such as a big dinner or a ball. And the public is admitted here, you know, once a week. That's nice. I beg pardon, madam. I'm afraid the fire is not usually lit in the library until the afternoon, but you'll find one in the morning room. Of course, if you wish this fire lit now, madam. Oh, no, Fred, I wouldn't dream. Uh, Mrs. De Winter, <clears throat> I mean the late Mrs. De Winter, always did her correspondence and telephoning in the morning room after breakfast. Thank you, Fred.
Mrs. De Winter? Oh, I'm afraid you've made a mistake. Mrs. De Winter's been dead for over a year. Oh, I mean... Uh... Oh, that was the house telephone, madam. Probably the head gardener wishing instructions. Did you want to see me, Mrs. Danvers? Mr. De Winter informed me that his sister, Mrs. Lacey, and Major Lacey are expected for luncheon. I'd like to know if you approve of the menu. Oh, well, well, I'm, I'm sure it's very suitable, very, very nice indeed. You'll notice, madam, that I've left a blank space for the sauce. Mrs. De Winter was most particular about sauces. Um, let's have whatever you think that Mrs. De Winter would have ordered. Thank you, madam. When you've finished your letters, Robert will take them to the post. My, le my letters? Oh, yes, of, of course. Thank you, Mrs. Danvers. You, Philip? Good morning, Mrs. Lacey. Where's Mr. De Winter? I believe he went down to the farm with Mr. Crawley. How tiresome of him not to be here when we arrive, and how typical. <laughs> I must say, old Danvers keeps the house looking lovely. She certainly learnt that trick of arranging flowers from Rebecca. I wonder how she likes it now. Being ordered about by an ex-chorus girl. Now, where on earth did you get the idea she's an ex-chorus girl? He picked her up in the south of France, didn't he? What if he did? Well, I mean to say, there you are. How do you do? I, I'm Maxim's wife. How do you do? Well, I must say, you're quite different from what I expected. Oh, but so silly, she's exactly what I told you she'd be. Well, how do you like Mandela? It's very beautiful, isn't it? And how do you get along with Mrs. Danvers? Well, I... I've never met anyone quite like her before. You mean she scares you? She's not exactly an oil painting, is she? Giles, <laughs> you're very much in the way here. Go somewhere else. Well, I'll try and find Maxim, shall I? Giles. I, I didn't mean to say anything against Mrs. Danvers. It... Oh, there's no need for you to be frightened of her. But I shouldn't have any more to do with her than you can help. Uh, shall we sit down? Oh, oh yes, yes, please. You see, she's bound to be insanely jealous at first. And she must resent you bitterly. But why should she? Don't you know? I should have thought Maxine would have told you. She simply adored Rebecca. How are you, Robert? Quite well, thank you, madam. Still having trouble with your teeth? Unfortunately, yes, madam. You should have them out. All of them. Wretched nuisances, teeth. Thank you, madam. Oh, what a plate for. Do you hunt? No, I don't. I, I'm afraid I don't even ride. Oh, I have to ride down here. We all do. Which do you ride? Side saddle or, or a stride? Oh, yes, of course, I forgot you don't, do you? <laughs> you must. Nothing else to do down here. Maxine, when are you going to have parties here again, like the old days? Oh, I haven't thought about it. But everyone's dying to see you, and... Uh... Yes, I bet they are. Why don't you have the masquerade ball again this summer? <laughs> well... My dear, are you fond of dancing? I love it, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> Do you rumble? I've never tried. You must teach me. I say, oh, but I'm trying to find out exactly what your wife does do. <laughs> uh, she sketches a little. Sketches? <laughs> not this modern stuff. I hope you know portrait of a lampshade upside down to, to represent a soul in torment. <laughs> don't sail, do you? No, I don't. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. You're very much in love with Maxim, aren't you? Yes, I can see you are. Don't mind my saying so, but why don't you do something about your hair? Why don't you have it cut or sweep it back behind your ears? Oh, no, that's worse. 
What does Maxim say about it? Does he like it like that? Well, he never mentions it. Oh, well, don't go by me. I can see by the way you dress, you don't care a hoot how you look. But I wonder Maxim hasn't been at you. He's so particular about clothes. I don't think he ever notices what I wear. Oh, well, he must have changed a lot then. <laughs> you mustn't worry about old Maxim and his moods. One never knows what goes on in that quiet mind of his. Often he gets into a terrible rage, and when he does... <whistles> but I don't suppose he'll lose his temper with you. You seem such a placid little thing. Come along, old girl. We've got to be on the first tee at three o'clock. All right, I'm coming. Well, goodbye, Maxim, old boy. Goodbye, Giles. Thanks for coming, old boy. Goodbye, my dear. Forgive me for asking you so many rude questions. We both really hope you'll be very happy. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you very much. And I must congratulate you upon the way Maxim looks. We were very worried about him this time last year. But then, of course, you know the whole story. Goodbye, Beatrice. Aunt. Goodbye, old boy. Oh, well, thank heavens they've gone. Now we can have a walk about the place. Looks as though we might have a shower, but she won't mind that, do you? No, but wait a minute, I'll go upstairs and get a coat. Uh, there's a heap of Macintoshes in the flower room. Robert, run and get a coat from the flower room for Mrs. De Winter, will you? What do you think of Beatrice? Oh, I liked her very much, but she kept saying that I was quite different from what she expected. What the devil did she expect? Oh, someone smarter and more sophisticated, I'm afraid. Oh. Uh, do you like my hair? Your hair? Mm -hmm. yes, of course I do. What's the matter with it? Oh, I don't know. I, I just wanted that. <laughs> Funny you are. <laughs> Thank you. Do I have to put it on? Yes, certainly, certainly, certainly. Can't be too careful with children. Come on, Jasper, come and take some of that fat off. Jasper! Here, not that way. Come here. Where does that lead to? Oh, it leads to a little cove where we used to keep a boat. Oh, let's go down there. Well, no, it's a perfectly dull, uninteresting stretch of sand, just like any other. Oh, please. Well, all right, we'll walk down and take a look if you really want to. That's Jasper. There must be something wrong. Perhaps he's hurt himself. No, he's all right. Leave him alone. Don't you think I'd better go and see? Don't bother about him, I tell you. He can't come to any harm. He'll find his own way back. I know that dog. He comes for the house. He ain't yours. No, he's he's Mr. De Winter's dog. Have you anything I could I could tie him with? You saw me in there, will you? Don't you belong on the estate? I weren't doing nothing. I was just putting Michelle's away. She's gone in the sea, ain't she? She'll never come back no more. No, she'll never come back. Come on, Jasper. You knew I didn't want you to go there, but you deliberately went. Why not? 
There was only a cottage down there and a strange man who... You didn't go into the cottage, did you? Yes, the door... Well, don't go there again, do you hear? Well, why not? Because I hate the place, and if you had my memories, you wouldn't go there or talk about it or even think about it. What's the matter? Oh, I'm sorry, please. We should have stayed away. We should never have come back to Mandalay. Oh, what a fool I was. I made you unhappy. Somehow I've hurt you. Oh, I can't bear to see you like this. Because I love you so much. Do you? Do you? Ah, I've made you cry. Forgive me. I sometimes seem to fly off the handle for no reason at all. Don't I? Come. We'll go home and have some tea and forget all about it. Yes, let's forget all about it. Here, let me have Jasper. said the other day about um, showing me the run of things. Of course I did. What are you doing now? Notifying all the tenants that in celebration of Maxim's return with his bride, this week's rent will be free. Oh, was that Maxim's idea? Oh, yes. All the servants get an extra week's wages, too. Oh, he didn't tell me. <laughs> uh, can't I help you? I, I could at least take the stamps. Well, that's terribly nice of you. Uh, won't you sit down? Oh, yes, thank you. I... I was down at the cottage on the beach the other day. There was a man there, a queer sort of person. Jasper kept barking at him. Oh, yeah. Must have been Ben. Excuse me. He's quite harmless. We give him odd jobs now and then. That cottage place seemed to be going to rack and ruin. Why isn't something done about it? Well, I think if Maxim wanted anything done about it, he'd tell me. Are those all Rebecca's things down there? Yes. Yes, they are. What did she use the cottage for? The boat used to be moored near there. What boat? What happened to it? Was that the boat she was sailing in when she was drowned? Yes. Capsized and sank. She was washed overboard. Wasn't she afraid to go out like that alone? She wasn't afraid of anything. Where did they find her? Near Edgecombe. About 40 miles up channel, about two months afterwards. Maxim went up to identify her. It was horrible for him. Yes, it must have been. Mr. Crawley, please don't think me morbidly curious. It isn't that. It's just that I feel it's such a disadvantage. All the time, whenever I meet anyone, Maxim's sister or even the servants, I, I know they're all thinking the same thing. They're all comparing me with her, with... with Rebecca. Oh, you mustn't think that. I can't tell you how glad I am that you married Maxim. It's going to make all the difference to his life. And from my point of view, it's very refreshing to find someone like yourself who's not entirely in tune, shall we say, with Mandalay. That's very sweet of you. I dare say I, I've been stupid, but every day I, I realize the things that she had and that I lack. Beauty and, and wit and intelligence and oh, all the things that are so important in qualities that are just as important. More important, if I may say so. Kindness and sincerity and, oh, if you'll forgive me, modesty mean more to a husband than all the wit and beauty in the world. We none of us want to live in the past. Maxim, least of all. It's up to you, you know, to lead us away from it. I, I promise you I won't bring this up again, but before we end this conversation, would you answer just one more question? If it's something I'm able to answer, I'll do my best. Tell me, what was Rebecca really like? I suppose... I suppose she was the most 
beautiful creature I ever saw. of the honeymoon have arrived at last. We timed, you think, before dinner? What on earth have you done to yourself? Oh, nothing. I, I just ordered a new dress from London. I hope you don't mind. Oh, no. Only, well, do you think there's some things right for you? It doesn't seem your type at all. Oh, I thought you'd like it. And what have you put under your hair? Oh, I see. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. I'm sorry. <laughs> you look lovely, lovely. And it's very nice, for a change. Shall we see these pictures? Yes, I, I'd love to see them. Ah, look now. Oh, look at that. Oh, wasn't oh. it wonderful, darling? Can't we go back there someday? Yes, of course, of course. Ah, look at you. Uh, won't our grandchildren be delighted when they see how lovely you were? Oh, look at you. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Oh, I like that. <laughs> look at that. Oh, that's very nice. Oh, remember that. Yes. Oh, I wish our honeymoon could have lasted forever, Max. Oh, dash it, look. Oh, 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 hang it. Threaded it up wrong as usual or something. Yes, Fritz, what is it? Excuse me, sir. May I have a word with you? Yes. Come in. It's about Robert, sir. There's been a slight unpleasantness between him and Mrs. Danvers. Oh, dear. Robert is very upset. Oh, well, this is trouble. What is it? It appears that Mrs. Danvers has accused Robert of stealing a valuable ornament from the morning room. Robert denies the accusation most emphatically, sir. What was the thing, anyway? China Cupid, sir. Oh, dear. That's one of our treasures, isn't it? Well, tell Mrs. Danvers to get to the bottom of it somehow and tell her I'm sure it wasn't Robert. Very good, sir. Why do they come to me with these things? That's your job, sweetheart. Maxim, I, I wanted to tell you, but, um, well, I forgot. The fact is, I broke the China Cupid. You broke it? Now, why on earth didn't you say something about it when Fritz was here? I, I don't know. I, I didn't like to. I, I was afraid he'd think me a fool. Well, you think you're much more of a fool now. You'll have to explain to him and Mrs. Danforth. Uh, oh, no, Maxim, you do it. I'll, I'll go oh, upstairs. Don't be such a little idiot, darling. Anybody would think you were afraid of them. It's all a mistake, Mrs. Danvers. Apparently, Mrs. De Winter broke the cupid herself and forgot to say anything about it. I'm so sorry. I, I never thought that I'd get Robert into trouble. Is it possible to repair the ornament, madam? No, I'm afraid it isn't. It was smashed into pieces. What did you do with the pieces? Well, I, I put them at the back of one of the drawers in the writing desk. Well, it looks as though Mrs. De Winter were afraid you were going to put her in prison, doesn't it, Mrs. Danvers? Well, never mind. Do what you can to find the pieces, see if they can be mended, and above all, tell Robert to dry his tears. I shall apologize to Robert, of course. Perhaps if such a thing happens again, Mrs. De Winter will tell me personally. Yes, you? yes, all right. Thank you, Mrs. Danvers. Well, I suppose that clip will hold all right. I don't know. I'm awfully sorry, darling. It was very careless of me. Mrs. Danvers must be furious with me. Oh, hang Mrs. Danvers. Why on earth should you be frightened of her? Behave more like a upstairs maid or something, not like the mistress of the house at all. Yes, I know I do. But I feel so uncomfortable. I, I try my best every day, but it's very difficult with people looking me up and down as if I were a prize cow. Well, what does it matter if they do? You must remember that life at Mandel is the only thing that interests anybody down here. What a slap in the eye I must have been to them then. I suppose that's why you married me. Because you knew I was dull and gauche and inexperienced and there could never be any gossip about me. Gossip? What do you mean? I, I don't know. I, I just said it for something to say. Don't look at me like that. Maxim, what's the matter? What have I said? Wasn't a very attractive thing to say, was it? No. It was rude, hateful. Ah, 
I wonder if I did a very selfish thing in marrying you. How do you mean? I'm not much of a companion to you, am I? You don't get much fun, do you? You ought to have married a boy, someone of your own age. Maxim, why do you say this? Of course we're companions. Are we? I don't know. I'm very difficult to live with. No, you're not difficult. You're easy, very easy. Our marriage is a success, isn't it? A great success. We're happy, aren't we? Terribly happy. If you don't think we are happy, it would be much better if you didn't pretend. I'll go away. Why don't you answer me? How can I answer you when I don't know the answer myself? If you say we're happy, let's leave it at that. Happiness is something I know nothing about. Oh, look. That's the one when I left the camera running on the tripod, remember? Anything I can do for you? Yes, I'm all right, Hilda. Thank you very much. I'll bring the sandwiches immediately, madam. it anymore, do they? No, madam. Not since the death of Mrs. De Winter. Come along, Mr. Jack, or someone may see you. Well, Danny, old Harvey, it's good to see you again. I'm simply breathless to pick up all the news. I really don't think it's wise for you to come here, Mr. Jack. Jasper, come here. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. It's just like coming back home. Quiet, Mr. Jack. Yes, and we must be careful not to shock Cinderella, mustn't we? She's in the morning room. If you lead through the garden door, she won't see you. I must say, I feel a little like the poor relation sneaking around through back doors. Well, toodle-doo, Danny. Goodbye, Mr. Jack. And please be careful. Looking for me? Oh, I didn't make you jump, did I? No, of course not. I, I didn't quite know who it was. Yes. You're pleased to see me, aren't you, old boy? I'm glad there's someone in the family to welcome me back to Manderley. And, um, how is dear old Max? Very well, thank you. I hear he went up to London, left his little bride all alone. It's too bad. Isn't he rather afraid that somebody might come down and carry you off? Danny, all your precautions were in vain. The mistress of the house was hiding behind the door. Oh, what about presenting me to the bride? This is Mr. Favell, madam. How do you do? How do you do? Well, won't you have some tea or something? Well, now, isn't that a charming invitation? I've been asked to stay to tea, Danny, and I have a good mind to accept. Oh, well, perhaps you're right. Pity, just we're getting on so nicely. We mustn't lead the young bride astray, must we, Jasper? Goodbye. 
been fun meeting you. Oh, and by the way, um, it would be very decent of you if you wouldn't mention this little visit to your revered husband. He uh, doesn't exactly approve of me. Very well. That's very sporting of you. I wish I had a young bride of three months waiting for me at home. I'm just a lonely old bachelor. Fare thee well. Oh, oh and um, I know what was wrong with that introduction. Danny didn't tell you, did she? I am Rebecca's favorite cousin. Toodaloo. wish anything, madam. I didn't expect to see you, Mrs. Danvers. I, I noticed that the window wasn't closed and I came up to see if I could fasten it. Why did you say that? I closed it before I left the room. You opened it yourself, didn't you? You've always wanted to see this room, haven't you, madam? Why did you never ask me to show it to you? I was ready to show it to you every day. Lovely room, isn't it? Loveliest room you've ever seen. Everything is kept just as Mrs. De Winter liked it. Nothing has been altered since that last night. Come, I'll show you her dressing room. This is where I keep all her clothes. You would like to see them, wouldn't you? Feel this. It was a Christmas present from Mr. De Winter. He was always giving her expensive gifts the whole year round. I keep her underwear on this side. They were made specially for her by the nuns in the convent of St. Clair. I always used to wait up for her, no matter how late. Sometimes she and Mr. De Winter didn't come home until dawn. While she was undressing, she'd tell me about the party she'd been to. She knew everyone that mattered. Everyone loved her. When she'd finished her bath, she'd go into the bedroom and go over to the dressing table. Oh, you've moved her brush, haven't you? There, that's better. Just as she always laid it down. Come on, Danny, hair drill, she would say. I'd stand behind her like this, and brush away for 20 minutes at a time. And then she would say, good night, Danny, and step into her bed. I 
I embroidered this case for her myself, and I keep it here always. Did you ever see anything so delicate? Look, you can see my hand. I think she'd been gone so long, would you? Sometimes, when I walk along the corridor, I fancy I hear her just behind me. That quick, light step. I couldn't mistake it anywhere. It's not only in this room. It's in all the rooms in the house. I can almost hear it now. Do you think the dead come back and watch the living? I don't believe it. Sometimes. I wonder if she doesn't come back here to Manderley. Watch you and Mr. De Winter together. You look tired. Why don't you stay here a while and rest? And listen to the sea. So soothing. Listen to it. Listen. Listen to the sea. Mrs. Danvers, I wish to see her immediately. You sent for me, madam. Yes, Mrs. Danvers. I want you to get rid of all these things. These are Mrs. De Winter's things. I am Mrs. De Winter now. Very well, I'll give the instructions. Just a moment, please. Mrs. Danvers, I intend to say nothing to Mr. De Winter about Mr. Favell's visit. In fact, I prefer to forget everything that happened this afternoon. Oh, I've been thinking. Well, what do you want to do that for? Well, come in here and I'll tell you. Uh, darling, could we have a costume ball just as you used to? Now, what put that into your mind? Has Beatrice been at you? No, no, but I feel that we ought to do something to, to, to make people feel that Mandalay is just the same as it always was. Oh, please, darling, could we? You don't know what it would mean, you know. You would have to be a hostess to hundreds of people. All the county. And a lot of young people would come up from London and turn the house into a nightclub. Oh, yes, but I want to. Oh, please. I've never been to a large party, but I could learn what to do. And, and I promise you, you wouldn't be ashamed of me. All right, if you think you'd enjoy it. You better get Mrs. Danvers to help you, haven't you? No, no, I, I don't need Mrs. Danvers to help me. I can do it myself. Oh, all right, my sweet. Oh, oh, thank you, darling. Thank you. Oh, well, uh, what do you go as? Oh, I never dress up. That's the one privilege I claim as the host. What will you be, Alice in Wonderland with that ribbon around your hair? No, I won't tell you. I'll design a costume over myself and give you the surprise of your life. <laughs> <laughs>
Amen. Robert found these sketches in the library, madam. Did you intend throwing them away? Yes, Mrs. Danvers, I did. They were just some ideas I was sketching for my costume for the ball. Hasn't Mr. De Winter suggested anything? No, I want to surprise him. I don't want him to know anything about it. I merely thought that you might find a costume among the family portraits that would suit you. Oh, you mean those at the top of the stairs? I'll go and look at them. This one, for instance, it might have been designed for you. I'm sure you could have it copied. I've heard Mr. De Winter say that this is his favorite of all the paintings. It's Lady Caroline De Winter, one of his ancestors. Oh, well, 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 that's a splendid idea, Mrs. Danvers. I'm, I'm very grateful. Under control, Fred? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, sir. Are you supposed to be a schoolmaster? Oh, no. This is just my old cap and gown. <laughs> Certainly makes a very nice costume, sir. Uh, and economical, too. Uh, yes, that was the idea. Evening, Robert. Not very good weather for the ball. No, sir. Very misty on the way. And very chilly. Oh, this week's so tight, they ought to have sent an aspirin with it. <laughs> Hello. Oh. What's the idea, Adam and Eve? Oh, Maxim, don't be disgusting. <laughs> Strong man, old man. Yes. Where's my weight thing? What thing? You haven't left it in the car, have you? Oh. Oh, there it is. You were the first one down? Yes. Where's the child? Well, she's keeping her costume, a terrific secret. Wouldn't even let me into her room. Oh, lovely. I'll go up and give her a hand. <laughs> I could do with a drink. <laughs> Won't you catch cold on that thing? Don't be silly. Pure wool, old boy. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. You forgot this. Here I am, dear. It's B. I've come to give you a hand. Oh, please don't come in, Beatrice. I don't want anyone to see my costume. Oh. Oh, well, you won't be long, will you? Because the first people will be arriving any moment. Now, you're sure that's where that should be? Yes, madam, it's just right. Oh, isn't it exciting? Indeed it is, madam. I've always heard of the Mandalay Ball, and now I'm really going to see one. I'm sure there'll be no one there to touch you, madam. Do you really think so? Now, now, where's my fan? Now, you're sure I look all right? You look ever so beautiful. Well, here goes. Good evening, Mr. De Winter. What the devil do you think you're doing? Back. Oh. But it, it, it's the picture, the, the one in the gallery. What is it? What have I done? Go and take it off. Doesn't matter what you put on, anything will do. What are you standing there for? Didn't you hear what I said? Sir George and Lady Moore, Blood Lieutenant, Admiral and Lady Burbank. I watched you go down, just as I watched her a year ago. 
Even in the same dress, you couldn't compare. You knew it. You knew that she wore it, and yet you deliberately suggested I wear it. Why do you hate me? What have I done to you that you should ever hate me so? You tried to take her place. You let him marry you. I've seen his face, his eyes. They're the same as those first weeks after she died. I used to listen to him, walking up and down, up and down, all night long, night after night, thinking of her, suffering torture because he'd lost her. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. You thought you could be Mrs. DeWinder. Live in her house, walk in her steps, take the things that were hers, but she's too strong for you. You can't fight her. No one ever got the better of her. Never, never. She was beaten in the end, but it wasn't a man, it wasn't a woman. It was the sea. Oh, stop it, stop it, oh, stop it. <laughs> Overwrought, madam. I've opened a window for you. A little air will do you good. Why don't you go? Why don't you leave Manderley? He doesn't need you. He's got his memories. He doesn't love you. He wants to be alone again with her. You've nothing to stay for. You've nothing to live for, really, have you? Look down there. It's easy, isn't it? Why don't you? Why don't you? Ben, have you seen Mr. De Winter anyway? She won't come back, will she? You said so. Who, oh, Ben? What do you mean? Ah, the other one. Oh, Frank, have you seen Maxim anywhere? Not since about half an hour ago. I thought he'd gone up to the house. No, he hasn't been in the house at all, and I'm afraid something might have happened to him. Frank, what's the matter? Is anything wrong? There is something wrong. Well, the diver who went down to inspect the bottom of the ship came across the hull of another boat, a little sailboat. Frank, is it? Yes. It's Rebecca's. How did they recognize it? It was a local man. Knew it instantly. It'll be so hard on poor Maxim. Yes. It's going to bring it all back again. And worse than before. Why did they have to find it? Why couldn't they have left it there in peace at the bottom of the sea? Why? Better get along and arrange some breakfast for the men. All right, Frank. I'll, I'll go and look for Maxim. Sleep. Have you forgiven me? 
forgiven you. What have I got to forgive you for? For last night, my stupidity about the costume. Oh, that. I'd forgotten. I was angry with you, wasn't I? Mm. Maxim, can't we start all over again? I don't ask that you should love me. I won't ask impossible things. I'll be your friend, your companion. I'll be happy with that. You love me very much, don't you? But it's too late, my darling. We've lost our little chance of happiness. No, Maxim, no. Yes. It's all over now. The things happen. The thing I've dreaded day after day. Night after night. Max, what are you trying to tell me? Rebecca has won. Her shadow has been between us all the time, keeping us from one another. She knew that this would happen. What are you saying? They sent a diver down. He found another boat. Yes, I know. Frank told me. Rebecca's boat. Oh, it's terrible for you. I'm so sorry. The diver made another discovery. Broke one of the ports and looked into the cabin. There was a body in there. Then she wasn't alone. There was someone sailing with her. And you have to find out who it was. That's it, isn't it, Maxim? You don't understand. There was no one with her. It's Rebecca's body lying there on the cabin floor. <laughs> the woman that was washed up at Edgecombe. The woman that is now buried in the family crypt. That was not Rebecca. That was the body of some unknown woman. Unclaimed, belonging nowhere. I identified it, but I knew it wasn't Rebecca. It was all a lie. I knew where Rebecca's body was. Lying on that cabin floor on the bottom of the sea. How did you know, Max? Because I put it there. Will you look into my eyes and tell me that you love me now? anything in the world. Oh, please, Maxim, kiss me, please. No. It's no use. It's too late. Oh, we can't lose each other now. We must be together always. No secrets, no shadows. We may only have a few days, a few hours. Maxim, why didn't you tell me before? Yeah, we did sometimes, but you never seemed close enough. How could we be close when I knew you were always thinking of Rebecca? How could I even ask you to love me when I knew you loved Rebecca still? What are you talking about? What do you mean? Whenever you touched me, I, I knew you were comparing me with Rebecca. Whenever you looked at me or spoke to me or walked with me in the garden, I knew you were thinking, this I did with Rebecca, and this, and this. Oh, it's true, isn't it? You thought I loved Rebecca? You thought that? I hated her. carried away by her, enchanted by her, as everyone was. And when I was married, I was told I was the luckiest man in the world. She was so lovely, so accomplished, so amusing. She's got the three things that really matter in a wife, everyone says. Breeding, brains, and beauty. And I believed them completely. But I never had a moment's happiness with her. 
she was incapable of love or tenderness or decency. You didn't love her. You didn't love her. Do you remember that cliff where you first saw me in Monte Carlo? Well, I went there with Rebecca on our honeymoon. That was when I found out about her, four days after we were married. She stood there laughing, her black hair blowing in the wind, and told me all about herself, everything. Things I'll never tell a living soul. I wanted to kill her. It would have been so easy. You remember the precipice? I frightened you, didn't I? You thought I was mad. Perhaps I was. Perhaps I am mad. It wouldn't make for sanity, would it? Living with the devil. <laughs> I'll make a bargain with you, she said. You'd look rather foolish trying to divorce me now after four days of marriage. So I'll play the part of a devoted wife, mistress of your precious mandolin. I'll make it the most famous show place in England, if you like. And people will visit us and envy us and say we're the luckiest, happiest couple in the country. What a grand joke it'll be. What a triumph. I should never have accepted her dirty bargain. But I did. I was younger then and tremendously conscious of the family honor. <laughs> family honor. She knew that I'd sacrifice everything rather than stand up in a divorce court and give her away, admit that our marriage was a rotten fraud. You despise me, don't you? As I despise myself. You can't understand what my feelings were. Can you? Of course I can, darling. Of course I can. Well, I kept the bargain, and so did she, apparently. Oh, she played the game brilliantly. But after a while, she began to grow careless. She took a flat in London and she'd stay away for days at a time. Then she started to bring her friends down here. I warned her, but she shrugged her shoulders. What's it got to do with you, she said. She even started on Frank. Poor, faithful Frank. Then there was a cousin of hers, a man named Favell. Yes, I know him. Came the day you went to London. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't like to. I... I thought it would remind you of Rebecca. Remind me? <laughs> As if I needed reminding. Favelle used to visit her here in this cottage. I found out about it and I warned her that if he came here again, I'd shoot them both. One night, when I found that she'd come back quietly from London, I thought that Favelle was with her. And I knew then that I couldn't stand this life of filth and deceit any longer. I decided to come down here and have it out with both of them. But she was alone. She was expecting Favelle, but he hadn't come. She was lying on the divan, a large tray of cigarette stubs beside her. She looked ill, queer. Suddenly she got up, started to walk toward me. When I have a child, she said, neither you nor anyone else could ever prove it wasn't yours. You'd like to have an heir, wouldn't you, Max, for your precious mandolin? And she started to laugh. How funny. How supremely, wonderfully funny. I'll be the perfect mother, just as I've been the perfect wife. No one will ever know. It ought to give you the thrill of your life, Max, to watch my son grow bigger day by day, and to know that when you die, Mandalay will be his. She was face to face with me. One hand in her pocket, the other holding a cigarette. She was smiling. Well, Max, what are you going to do about it? Aren't you going to kill me? I suppose I went mad for a moment. I must have struck her. She stood staring at me. She looked almost triumphant. Then she started toward me again, smiling. Suddenly she stumbled and fell. When I looked down, ages afterwards, it seemed, she was lying on the floor. She struck her head 
on a heavy piece of ship's tackle. I remember wondering why she was still smiling. And I realized she was dead. But you didn't kill her. It was an accident. Who would believe me? I lost my head. I just knew I had to do something. Anything. I carried her out to the boat. It was very dark. There was no moon. I put her in the cabin. When the boat seemed a safe distance from the shore, I took a spike and drove it again and again through the planking of the hull. I had opened up the sea cocks and the water began to come in fast. I climbed over into the dinghy and pulled away. I saw the boat heel over and sink. I pulled back into the cove. It started raining. Maxim, does anyone else know this? No, no one except you and me. We must explain it. It's got to be the body of someone you've never seen before. No, they're bound to know her. Her rings, bracelets she always wore. They'll identify her body. Then they'll remember the other woman. The other woman buried in the crypt. If they find out it was Rebecca, you must simply say that you made a mistake about the other body. Excuse me, sir. But there's a little more to it than that. Well, what do you mean, Mr. Tab? I mean, sir, the seacocks. What are the seacocks? Seacocks? Oh. Well, the seacocks are the valves to drain out the boat. And they're always kept tight closed when you're afloat. Yes? Well, yesterday, when I examined that boat, I found they'd been open. Well, what could be the reason for that? Just this. That's what flooded the boat and sunk her. Are you implying... That boat never capsized at all. I know it's a terrible thing to say, sir. But in my opinion, she was scuttled. And there's them holes. What holes? In her planking. What are you talking about? Of course, that boat's been underwater for over a year. And tide's been knocking her against the ridge. But it seemed to me them holes looked as if she'd made them from the inside. Then you believe she must have done it deliberately? Couldn't have been no accident. Not with her knowledge of boats. You knew the former Mrs. De Winter very well, I believe. Oh, yes. Would you believe her capable of suicide? No. Frankly, I would not. You never can tell. You may stand down, Mr. Tab. Mr. De Winter, please. I'm sorry to drag you back for further questioning, Mr. De Winter, but you've heard the statement of Mr. Tabb. I wonder if you can help us in any way. I'm afraid not. Can you think of any reason why there should be holes in the planking of the late Mrs. De Winter's boat? Well, of course I can't think of any reason. Has anyone ever discussed these holes with you before? Well, since the boat has been at the bottom of the ocean, I scarcely think that likely. Mr. De Winter, I want you to believe we all feel very deeply for you in this matter, but you must remember that I don't conduct this inquiry for my own amusement. That's rather obvious, isn't it? I hope that it is. Well, since Mrs. De Winter went sailing alone, are we to believe that she drove those holes herself? You, well, you may believe what you like. Can you enlighten us as to why Mrs. De Winter should have wanted to end her own life? I know of no reason whatever. Mr. De Winter, however painful it may be, I have to ask you a very personal question. Were relations between you and the late Mrs. De Winter perfectly happy? Were relations between you and the late Mrs. De Winter perfectly happy? I won't stand this any longer, and you might as well know now. My wife, she's fit. She's fit. We'll adjourn till after lunch. Mr. De Winter, I presume you'll be available for us then? I told you we should have had some breakfast. You're hungry, that's what's the matter with you. Mr. Fifth thought you might like to have some lunch from the house and sent me with it. Oh, that's fine, man. And can you pull around the corner? Very good, sir. Foolish of me fainting like that. Nonsense. If you hadn't fainted like that, I'd have really lost my temper. Darling, please be careful. <laughs> darling, wait here a few moments. I'll see if I can find old Frank. Of course, darling. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. Sure. Mm. Yes. Have a spot of this. Do you good. Thank you. Are you all right? Don't be long. Right you are. Good 
Hello. And how does the bride find herself today? I say, marriage with Max is not exactly a bed of roses, is it? I think you'd better go before Maxim gets back. Oh, jealous, is he? Well, I can't say I blame him. But you don't think I'm the big bad wolf, do you? I'm not, you know. I'm a perfectly ordinary, harmless bloke. And I think you're behaving splendidly over all this. Perfectly splendidly. You know, you've grown up a bit since I last saw you. It's no wonder. What do you want, fellow? Oh, hello, Max. Things are going pretty well for you, aren't they? Better than you ever expected. I was rather worried about you at first. That's why I came down to the inquest. Well, I'm touched by your solicitude, but if you don't mind, we'd rather like to have our lunch. Lunch? I say, what a jolly idea. Rather like a picnic, isn't it? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Do you mind if I put this there? You know, Max, old boy, I really think I ought to talk things over with you. Talk about things over. Well, those holes in the planking, for one thing. Those holes that were drilled from the inside. Oh, uh, Mullen. Yes, sir? And would you like a good fellow to have my car filled with petrol? It's almost empty. Very good, sir. And Mullen, close the door, will you? Yes, sir. Does this bother you? You know, boy, I have a strong feeling that before the day is out, somebody's going to make use of that uh, rather expressive, though somewhat old-fashioned term, foul play. Am I, am I boring you with all this? No? Good. Well, you see, Max, I find myself in a rather awkward position. You've only got to read this note to understand. It's from Rebecca. And what's more, she had the foresight to put a date on it. She wrote it to me the day she died. Incidentally, I was out on a party on that night, so I didn't get it until the next day. And what makes you think that note would interest me? Oh, I'm not going to bother you with the contents now, but I can assure you that it is not the note of a woman who intends to drown herself that same night. By the way, what do you do with old bones? Better than they were. However, for the time being... You know, Max, I'm getting awfully fed up with my job as a motor car salesman. I don't know if you've ever experienced the feeling of driving an expensive motor car that isn't your own, but it can be very, very exasperating. You know what I mean. You want to own the car yourself. I have often wonder what it'd be like to retire to the country, have a nice little place with a few acres of shooting. I never figured out what it would cost a year, but I'd like to talk about it with you. I'd like to have your advice on how to live comfortably without hard work. Hello, Favel. Are you looking for me, Maxim? Yes. Mr. Favel and I have a little business transaction on hand. I think we had better conduct it over at the inn. They may have a private room there. Well, see you later. Find Colonel Julian. Tell him I want to see him immediately. Come on, Favel, let's go. Uh, have you a private room, please? Of course, sir. Through there, sir. Hope this will do, Mr. De Winter. Oh, it's splendid. Splendid. Exactly like the Ritz. <laughs> Any orders, gents? Yes, you might bring me a large brandy and soda. How about you, Max? Have one on me. I feel I can afford to play host. Thanks, I don't mind if I do. Make it two, will you, like a good fellow? <laughs> Very good, sir. Where's Mr. De Winter? Oh, oh uh, through the other door, sir. Colonel Julian, this is Mr. Pavel. Oh, I know Colonel Julian. We're old friends, aren't we? Well, since you're old friends, I assume you also know he's head of the police here. I think he might be interested to hear your proposition. Go on, tell him all about it. I don't know what you mean. I mean, I said I hope to give up selling cars and retire into the country. Actually, he offered to withhold a vital piece of evidence from the inquest if I made it worth his while. I only want to see justice done, Colonel. Now, that boat builder's evidence suggested certain possible theories concerning Rebecca's death. One of them, of course, is suicide. Now, I have a little note here which I consider puts that possibility quite out of court. Read it, Colonel. Jack, darling, I've just seen the doctor and I'm going down to Mandalay right away. I shall be at the cottage all this evening and shall leave the door open for you. I have something terribly important to tell you. Rebecca. Now, does that look like the note of a woman who had made up her mind to kill herself? And apart from that, Colonel, do you mean to tell me that if you wanted to commit suicide, you'd go to all the trouble of putting out to sea in a boat and then take a hammer and chisel and laboriously knock holes through the bottom of it? Come, Colonel, as an officer of the law, don't you feel there are some slight grounds for suspicion? Of murder? What else? You've known Max a long time, so you know he's the old-fashioned type who'd die to defend his honor or who'd kill for it. It's blackmail, pure and simple. Blackmail is not so pure nor so simple. It can bring a lot of trouble to a great many people. 
And the blackmailer sometimes finds himself in jail at the end of it. Oh, I see. You're going to hold the winter's hand through all this. Just because he's the big noise around here, and he's actually permitted you to dine with him. Be careful, Favell. You have brought an accusation of murder. Have you any witnesses? Oh, I do have a witness. Oh. Said fellow Ben. That stupid coroner hadn't been as much of a snob as you are, he'd have seen that halfwit was hiding something. And why should Ben do that? Because we caught him once, Rebecca and I, peering at us through the cottage window. Rebecca threatened him with the asylum, and that's why he was afraid to speak. But he was always hanging about. He must have seen this whole thing. It's ridiculous even listening to all this. Ah, you're like a little trades union, all of you, aren't you? And if my guess is right, Crawley, there's a bit of malice in your soul toward me, isn't there? Crawley didn't have much success with Rebecca. But uh, he ought to have more luck this time. And the bride will be grateful for your fraternal arm, Crawley, in a week or so. Every time she faints, in fact. Go oh, back! Maxim, please! Yeah. That temper of yours will do you in yet, Max. Oh, uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Now, is there anything else? Uh, yes. You might bring Mr. De Winter a sedative. No, no, nothing at all. Just leave us. <coughs> Very good. Now, Pavel, let's get this business over. As you seem to have worked out the whole thing so carefully, perhaps you can provide us also with a motive. Ah, I knew you were going to bring that up, Colonel. I've read enough detective stories to know that there must always be a motive. And if you'll all excuse me a moment, I'll supply that too. I wish you'd go home. You ought not to be here through all this. Please let me stay, Max. Surely, Colonel Julian, you're not going to allow this fellow to... Call. My opinion of Favelle is no higher than yours, Crawley. But in my official capacity, I have no alternative but to pursue his accusation. I entirely agree with you, Colonel. In a matter so serious as this, we must make sure of every point. Explore every avenue. And, in fact, if I may coin a phrase, leave no stone unturned. Ah, here she is, the missing link, the witness who will help supply the motive. Colonel Julian, Mrs. Danvers, I believe you know everyone else. Won't you sit down? No offense, Colonel, but I think I'll put this to Danny. She'll understand it more easily. Danny, who was Rebecca's doctor? Mrs. DeWitt always had Dr. McLean from the village. Now, you heard I said Rebecca's doctor in London. I don't know anything about that. Oh, don't give me that, Danny. You knew everything about Rebecca. You knew she was in love with me, didn't you? Surely you haven't forgotten the good times she and I used to have down at the cottage on the beach. She had a right to amuse herself, didn't she? Love was a game to her, only a game. It made her laugh, I tell you. She used to sit in her bed and rock with laughter at the lot of you. Can you think of any reason why Mrs. De Winter should have taken her own life? No, no, I refuse to believe it. I knew everything about her and I won't believe it. There, you see, it's impossible. She knows that as well as I do. Now, listen to me, Danny. We know that Rebecca went to a doctor in London on the last day of her life. Who was it? I don't know. Oh, I understand, Danny. You think we're asking you to reveal secrets of Rebecca's life. You're trying to defend her, but that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to clear her name of the suspicion of suicide. Mrs. Danvers, it has been suggested Mrs. De Winter was deliberately murdered. There you have it in a nutshell, Danny. But there's one more thing you'll want to know. The name of the murderer. It's a lovely name that rolls off the tongue so easily. George Fortescue Maximilian De Winter. There was a doctor. Mrs. De Winter sometimes went to him privately. She used to go to him even before she was married. We don't want reminiscences, Danny. What was his name? Dr. Baker, 165 Goldhawk Road, Shepherd's Bush. There you are, Colonel. There's where you'll find your motive. Go and question Dr. Baker. He'll tell you why Rebecca went to him. To confirm the fact that she was going to have a child. A sweet, curly-headed little child. It isn't true. It isn't true. She would have told me. She told Max about it. Max, who knew he wasn't the father, so like the gentleman of the old school that he is, he killed her. I'm afraid we shall have to question this, Dr. Baker. Hear, hear. But for safety's sake, I think I'd like to go along, too. Yes, unfortunately, I suppose you have the right to ask that. I'll see the coroner and have the inquest postponed pending further evidence. I say, aren't you rather afraid that the uh, prisoner, shall we say, might bolt? You have my word for it that he will not do that. To Lou, Max. Come along, Danny. Let's leave the unhappy couple to spend their last moments together alone. Are you sure you don't want me to go with you, Max? No, darling, it'll be very tiring for you. I'll be back the very first thing in the morning, and um, I won't even stop to sleep. I'll be waiting for you.
Ready, Maxim? Yes. You two go on ahead. I'll follow with Favelle. Dr. Baker, you may have seen Mr. De Winter's name in the papers recently. Oh, yes, yes, in connection with the body that was found in a boat. My wife was reading all about it, a very sad case. My condolences. Oh, this is going to take hours, let me... Don't bother, Favelle, I think I can tell Dr. Baker. We're trying to discover certain facts concerning the late Mrs. De Winter's activities on the day of her death. October the 12th, last year. And I want you to tell me, if you can, if anyone of that name paid you a visit on that date. I'm awfully sorry. I'm afraid I can't help you. I should have remembered the name De Winter. I've never attended a Mrs. De Winter in my life. Well, how can you possibly tell all your patients' names? Oh. I can look it up in my engagement diary, if you like. <clears throat> Did you say the 12th of October? Yes. Uh, here we are. No. No De Winter. Are you sure? Well, here are all the appointments for that day. Ross, Campbell, Steadall, Perino, Danvers, Matthews. Danny! Yeah. What the devil? Would you read that name again? Did you say Danvers? Yes, I have a Mrs. Danvers for three o'clock. What did she look like? Can you remember? Yes, I remember her quite well. She was a very beautiful woman. Tall, dark, exquisitely dressed. Rebecca. The lady must have used an assumed name. Is that so? This is a surprise. I've known her a long time. What was the matter with her? My dear sir, there are certain ethics. Could you supply a reason, Dr. Baker, for Mrs. De Winter's suicide? For her murder, you mean? She was going to have a kid, wasn't she? Come on, out with it. T tell me what else would a woman of her class be doing in a dump like this? I take it the official nature of this visit makes it necessary for me to... I assure you, we'd not be troubling you if it were not necessary. You want to know if I can suggest any motive as to why Mrs. De Winter should have taken her life? Yes, I think I can. The woman who called herself Mrs. Danvers was very seriously ill. She was not going to have a child. Well, that was what she thought. My diagnosis was different. I sent her to a well-known specialist for an examination and x-rays. And on this date, she returned to me for his report. I remember her standing here, uh, holding out her hand for the photograph. I want to know the truth, she said. I don't want soft words in a bedside manner. If I'm for it, you can tell me right away. I knew she was not the type to accept a lie. She'd asked for the truth, I let her have it. She thanked me. I never saw her again, so I assumed that... Uh, what was wrong with her? Cancer. Yes, the growth was deep-rooted. An operation would have been no earthly use at all. In a short time, she would have been under morphia. There was nothing that could be done for her except wait. Did she say anything when you told her? She smiled in a queer sort of way. Your wife was a wonderful woman, Mr. De Winter. And, oh, yes, I remember she said something that struck me as being very peculiar at the time. When I told her it was a matter of months, she said, Oh, no, Doctor, not that long. You've been very kind. You've told us all we wanted to know. We should probably need an official verification. Verification? Yes, sir, to confirm the verdict of suicide. I understand. Can I offer you gentlemen a glass of sherry? Oh, very kind. I think we ought to be going. Thank heaven we know the truth. Oh, dreadful thing. Dreadful. A young and lovely woman like that. No wonder I never had the remotest idea. Neither did Danny, I'm sure. I wish I had a drink. Will we be needed at the inquest any further, Colonel Julian? No. I can see to it that makes him not trouble any further. Thank you, sir. Are you ready to start, Colonel? No, thank you. I'm staying in town tonight. And let me tell you, Favelle, blackmail is not much of a profession. And we know how to deal with it in our part of the world, strange as it may seem to you. Oh, I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about. But if you ever need a new car, Colonel, just let me know. It's impossible to thank you for your kindness to us through all this. You know what I feel without my saying it. Not at all. Put the whole thing behind you. But let your wife know she'll be getting worried. Yes, of course. I'll phone her at once, then we'll get straight down to Manchester. Goodbye, Crawley. Maxim's got a great friend. Yes, Maxim? Something you don't know. Oh, no, there isn't.
I didn't kill her, Frank. But I know now that when she told me about the child, she wanted me to kill her. She lied on purpose. She foresaw the whole thing. That's why she stood there laughing when she... Don't think about it anymore. Thank you, Frank. Well, Danny, I just wanted to tell you the news. Rebecca held out on both of us. She had cancer. Yes, suicide. And now Max and that dear little bride of his will be able to stay on at Mandalay and live happily ever after. Bye-bye, Danny. This your car, sir? Yes. Will you be going soon? This isn't a parking place, you know. Oh, isn't it? Well, people are entitled to leave their cars outside if they want to. It's a pity some of you fellows haven't anything better to do. When you phoned, did she say she'd wait up? I asked her to go to bed, but she wouldn't hear of it. I wish I could get some more speed out of this thing. Is something worrying you, Maxim? I can't get over the feeling something's wrong. clock's wrong. Must be three or four. Why? That can't be the dawn breaking over there. It's in the winter that you see the northern lights, isn't it? That's not the northern lights. That's Mandalay. She said she'd rather destroy Mandalay than see us happy here. Look! The West Wing! 